Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. And I'm Chris Noble. And we're on a journey to explore the brightest and most innovative minds and initiatives in social purpose. Today, companies and brands must stand for something meaningful. They have to have a social purpose and bring that purpose forward to their employees, their customers, and their community. Each episode, we're talking to leaders at Fortune 100 companies, global brands, social enterprise startups, NGOs, and everything in between. We'll be taking a deep dive to learn how they are integrating purpose into their organizations. To benefit both business and society for enduring impact. Join us. Welcome to Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn, and I have a wonderful special guest with me, Atlanta McElrath. She's the Senior Manager of Community Engagement at, at Timberland, and, and welcome, Atlanta. Thank you, Carol. It's a pleasure to be here. And Atlanta has been an old friend for many years. Um, we uh, both travel in the social impact space in many ways. Um, she's been at Timberland for, it's right on, I think, 14 years. Pretty much coming up. Yeah, yeah. And she's also incredibly well-educated. Um, she's got a BA from Duke. I'm going to embarrass you. An MBA from Chapel Hill. And she has an unwavering commitment to Timberland's values. Um, she's going to talk about um, what it means to be an earth keeper. And I was so excited that um, the company had a spotlight on Atlanta to be their first earth keeper interview of any of their employees. So she is just in her heart. She loves social purpose. And um, she also leads and trains a team of almost 30 global stewards she's going to talk about. And then um, earlier in her career, she was the national public affairs manager for The Body Shop, which was one of my favorite companies early on. So let's let's get into it. So Atlanta, what sparked your interest in social purpose? I think, you know, it started when I was a kid. I just always had concerns about injustice of the the injustices that I was seeing in the world. And I think it wasn't really until I went to college that I learned how to channel all these concerns that I had into activism. And so in college, I took uh, courses in community organizing, and that was the career I pursued when I got out of college. And it was through all of that uh, all of that exposure to needs in the community and how you need to bring communities together to address them that I got really interested in social purpose. And, and you call yourself um, a mission-driven corporate responsibility leader. What does that mean? <laughs> to me, it means that in terms of mission-driven, that's just who I am as a person and a human being. Yes, I do that professionally in my day job, but it's also a key part of who I am and how I interact with the community around me. And corporate social responsibility professional is there because that is my day job and that is my passion. I am passionate about seeing businesses take responsibility and start driving the change we need to see in the world. And so I'm thrilled to be a part of a company that also takes that responsibility by the horns and aims to be the best corporate citizen it can be. How have you seen responsibility uh, by corporations change over your career? Well, when I started working at the body shop, the body shop was definitely a standout at that time as a leader in corporate social responsibility, as a leader in advocacy. I mean, they would dedicate retail space more than once a year to promote different issues through their stores. The, when I was working for them, they had about 289 stores nationwide in the U.S., and they would take product promotions out of the windows and they would put windows in that were a call to action for consumers to engage in a variety of issues. 
that was very unique at that time. And what I've seen now in terms of corporate social responsibility, corporate social responsibility is becoming much more of the norm. It is no longer a differentiator for people to have a sustainability strategy. And I think what differentiates companies who are involved in that space is really the breadth and depth of their authentic dedication to the causes they promote. Well, that leads us into the definition of the brand Timberland. And I'd like to read this from the website. Our brand started with a boot, but now it's becoming something much bigger. It's become a mission, a movement, our soul. We're calling on those who aren't afraid to pull on their boots, get their hands dirty, and dig in. Those who won't take no for an answer. Those who care about the world we live in and know that a greener future is a better future. And those that will unite the same spirit in others. We all can be earth keepers. We all can be heroes. Every last one of us, because nature needs heroes. So let's talk about what it means to be an earth keeper um, from Timberland's point of view. Well, to be an earth keeper at Timberland, we are essentially a company of earth keepers. And if I may, I'd like to offer a little bit of history on that term, because earth keeper was originally the name we gave to a line of pinnacle product that included the most environmentally responsible materials we had access to and could use. So it began with a commitment to product. And then we realized that it was actually much broader than that, that it wasn't just a line of pinnacle environmentally responsible product, but it was really a whole philosophy and approach to how we do business. So Mm -hmm. I was pleased to see it come off the product and just become a moniker that represents how the company aims to be in the world. What it means to be an earth keeper, it really encapsulates the three major commitments we have in our CSR agenda, which are to create responsible products, to protect the outdoors, and to serve communities around the world. And so the people who work for Timberland have an opportunity to engage in one or more of those pillars of our CSR agenda through their work every day. And then how does that make you feel? And then how does that make your colleagues feel to be able to not separate their passion for the community or the environment or for making responsible products, but to have it integrated? Well, for me, it makes me feel proud. It makes me feel centered and aligned as a human being that I don't have to check my values at the door, come to work and pick them up when I leave the building. They are integrated and they are part of the work that I do. And I think other employees also share that same point of view. And I know that questions about our commitment to community service are sort of the most asked questions when people come in for interviews, when they're interviewing for jobs here. So I think, you know, we're reading much more in the in the media about how millennials care about the practices the of the the places where they work. They want to work for places that align with their beliefs and their values. And so as I look around at many of my younger colleagues here, I feel that they hopefully are feeling and experiencing that same alignment. And certainly from the feedback and the engagement that we see of employees here in this building, I would say that's the case. And you have on the service day, I mean, it's been part of Timberland for decades um, in, you know, I have, I represented Timberland in the earliest days, a number of times, and I was always awed by it. But can you talk again for our listeners, how do you make service more than just the one day checkoff? And, you know, what are Timberland's insights into really embedding it across the year? Well, I think the way we get it beyond the one day checkoff and the company wide corporate service day, which we do. We do two of those, by the way. But it's that starting early in nineteen ninety two, we launched an employee volunteer program. So twenty seven years ago this year. And it offered employees sixteen paid hours of community service. And by nineteen ninety five we increased that to forty paid hours, which is where it still is. So in essence, Timberland gives every employee 
a week, a work week, yeah. to be out in the community and serve in whatever way speaks to their passions. And to make it easy for employees to engage, we do have these two global corporate service days, which are really fun. We have Earth Day that happens in the spring and our own signature servapalooza, we call it. So you can tell that that term came about in the mid nineties. Um, <laughs> we have our own servapalooza event in the fall. And those are great days for employees worldwide to pull on their boots and make a difference in their community. And I think that there's always a role for those large scale corporate service days. You know, there's nothing quite like feeling like you're part of an army and you're out there. And when you've got hundreds of hands at a service site, you have a radical transformation from the beginning of the day to the end. And I think there's a, a huge sort of social value to those events as well in terms of having people work elbow to elbow and side by side with colleagues that they never knew worked in the building. And it's wonderful, a great equalizer because a lot of times we have employee volunteers leading the different project sites and they get to they get to boss the CEO around and everybody <laughs> loves that. that of course <laughs> right so i think the way we get it beyond the service day is that yes we do the service day and i think it's important for the community and for the employees and for the business to do that but we also give employees there's a balance right between the issues we focus on with the large group service days that align with our public mission as a company but we also give employees the freedom to serve in whatever way speaks to their passion and i think that's a really important distinction and an important point when you're starting an employee engagement program is to have some strategic focus that represents the brand appropriately in the community, but to give employees the freedom to tap into the causes that they most want to support and get really engaged and empowered by contributing to those. And you're just talking about the power of and, because we see the conundrum, uh, especially with millennials, which is, you know, I want to do my own thing. But we also see the desire of companies to have a focus so they can have a greater impact. So I'm really glad you, you talked about that. It's funny. I, I had this flashback when you said Serva Palooza that <laughs> got a zillion years ago. I remember I had my yellow boot on and I was actually nice. white painting a picket fence and it's like oh my god it was really yes. it was it was great fun um you know you also have the you drive this global stewards program and yeah. when we talk with companies they go how do i really deeply embed but not be directive but be decentralized to you know encourage my colleagues to get involved so can you give us some insights on how was that program created? How do you pick the people? And how do you really get them to dig in and, and spread the great ideas about service? Sure. So the program, the Global Stewards Program launched in 2006, and it was really a solve for the challenge we were facing, which is how do we expand the reach and impact of the CSR team without necessarily expanding headcount? You know, we didn't have the the freedom or luxury of having a CSR manager in every location where we operated. So we created the stewards program and basically the way it works is that passionate and dedicated employees volunteer for a two-year term to drive service and our CSR agenda around the world. So we have global goals and we empower the stewards to activate locally. And it's made a huge difference for us. We have, as you mentioned, 28 of them in 19 different countries around the world. And, you know, it, it all sort of harkens back to think, lo think globally and mm -hmm. act locally, mm. right? Because the stewards have really localized the strategy around employee engagement by creating opportunities for their employees to serve in ways that are going to resonate with their employee population. And they come up with these really creative ideas to engage employees that we never would have thought of here in Stratum. Mm. Like early on in the program, the we have about 7,000, well, now we have about 7,000 employees worldwide, and half of those 
work and live in the Dominican Republic where we own and operate the one manufacturing facility that we own. Um, we work with many factories around the world, but that's the one that we own. And most of the factory workers there do not have access to the internet or their own computers. So email is not a way to communicate with them. So the stewards, when we first launched the program, made a point. We provide transportation for the workers to come to and from the factory. The stewards made a point of getting on every bus route mm. and doing a presentation Great. about CSR Smart. on every bus. Mm-hmm. You reach every worker that way. You make the information and the people who are driving it there much more accessible and recognizable in that community. And that was one way of getting the word out. And then the other idea, again, in the DR, because Mm -hmm. they're so super passionate there, which is amazing. They had an idea about how do we keep this, this information fresh? And so over the PA system on the factory floor, they listened to merengue music. And so they invited employees to come up with a merengue song <laughs> that had to reference the CSR agenda and certain okay. make certain points in the lyrics. Yep. They essentially had a battle of the bands ah, and the it. winning band and uh-huh. song was recorded and played over the PA system. <laughs> and we all know how we remember lyrics to songs better yeah. than some other things. Yeah, for right? sure. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just an example, a super creative example of something that no one else in the world would have ever thought of because it's not necessarily relevant in other parts of the world, but it totally hit home in the Dominican Republic. And the stewards were responsible for that. So, Things like that, they've come up with other solutions in our distribution centers. It's very challenging to get everyone to serve on one day. In fact, that's a model that just doesn't work because you have to close the facility and that doesn't work from a business perspective. So early on, again, the stewards from the distribution facilities said, we want to have Earth Dance serve a Palooza, but what we want to do is have shorter shifts have multiple shifts over a period of multiple days. So everyone has the opportunity to get out and participate for at least one shift, as opposed to having it on one day where you're limiting the number of people who can participate. So let's talk a little bit about VF. Um, Timberland was independent. Um, I actually worked with Herman and Sydney, who were the sons of the founder, and then with Jeffrey. And um, you were fiercely independent, but now you've been part of the the VF Corporation of Brands. Um, What advice do you have for other brands who have the soul of Timberland? So it's very similar, but now they're part of something that's different and bigger. I would say stay authentic to who you are. Make the business case for why it works and show whoever acquires you what the opportunity is to grow the strategy bigger and throughout the rest of the enterprise. That's very powerful um, advice. Um, Can you relay a story? I am sure um, as the transition was happening, your role, because you have been there for so long, you're one of the most authentic earth keepers for Timberland. Who did you get to talk with at VF? And again, uh, how did you have a cross-functional team that made the case that Timberland needs to stay authentic? No, I mean, it was really VF's approach, right? They had acquired brands before us, and they were very clear on that first day. I remember it well when they came in saying that they let the brands continue to do what works and, you know, celebrate their unique culture. And so that was obviously what we all wanted to hear. And um, I think that's, that's how it played out. But one of the things they did that enabled us to sort of um, pollinate, I guess, some of mm-hmm. our ideas uh-huh. and and strategies that worked Mm -hmm. was that they convened a sustainability council. So they basically had the leads, the people who were leading the sustainability programs at all the different brands, they convened them into a council that would help guide the overall sustainability strategy for the whole enterprise. And in those convenings, there was a lot of opportunity to showcase programs that worked. Mm, And so an example, one of the examples I have is really from that time is that when VF acquired us, 
we had and had had for a long time a very strong code of conduct for the conditions in the conditions that we required of the factories that made our products around the world. I mentioned that we own and operate one factory, but we work with over 300 all around the world. So we had a program that not only did we have assessors going into that factory, those factories once a year to make sure that they were compliant with our code of conduct, but we also did a lot of work with the worker communities in those factories to talk about what were some of the challenges they were facing in their communities. And as a result of those sessions, specifically with the workers without management present, we were hearing of certain needs that they had. So for instance, we would ask the workers, do they have access to clean drinking water? And they would say, yes, they did. But on further investigation, we would test their water source and realize that it wasn't actually as clean as they thought. So then we had a partnership with Planet Water Foundation and would put clean uh, drinking water towers in the worker communities. So they did, in fact, have a purified source for their water. And what we found was that not only did that meet a need for the community, but it also was really good for business because no longer were the workers needing to walk, let's say, an hour to get their water, haul it back, go to their house, and then go to work, you know, which obviously you're pretty tired out by the time you've done that. So the workers were more productive, but they're also absenteeism was down. Their kids got sick less often. And so it just was a win for business, a win for the community. And when we were able to make the case for VF, you know what? They adopted that program for their high volume factories as well. So there's definitely been an opportunity and a channel to influence up. And I applaud VF for being very open to that. Tell us about your amazing work in Haiti with the Smallholder Farmers Alliance. We've been working with the Smallholder Farmers Alliance since 2010, initially on a project to plant 5 million trees in Haiti in five years, which they accomplished. But they did it in a way that engaged smallholder farmers and also the smallholder farmers helped do all the work to plant the trees. And in exchange, they got access to things they needed most, like better quality seed, tools, and training. And what we saw at the end of five years was not only had the trees been planted, but the farmers' crop yields and incomes had improved, and it was really making a difference all around. So we are have shifted now from being a donor to the Smallholder Farmers Alliance to being an investor. And when we looked at what could the farmers grow that we could use, cotton was the obvious answer. Now, cotton was once Haiti's fourth largest agricultural export, but due to politics and policies in the 1980s, the industry completely disappeared. And so we've been working with them since 2015 to bring it back. And I'm pleased to say that last month, well, actually in January, I was down in Haiti for the first commercial cotton harvest in Haiti, yes, that they'd had in 30 years. And the plan for that cotton that was harvested, and we were side by side in the field with some of these smallholder farmers, which was amazing, that the cotton that came from the harvest, we are sending to a mill. It's going to be woven into sample fabrics that we can, so we can start to spec product that we will introduce in our stores in the next couple of years with patient grown cotton. And I'm super excited about this because not only will we have a new sustainable supply chain of organic cotton for use in our products, But the Smallholder Farmers Alliance is still working with the farmers in the same way. So the program overall will help reforest Haiti and also help improve the farmers' lives through increasing their crop yields and incomes. And so it's just a win-win-win all around. And if anybody, it's a tremendous initiative and uh, with a very long tail, brilliant um, strategy. If anyone goes and looks at a map, of the island, you know, you see on the Haiti side, it's brown and on the DR side, it's green. And that's because those trees, I think you said in Engage for Good, that the trees became, they weren't valued and um, they were burned. 
Yeah, they were worth more dead than alive, essentially, because about 75% of Haiti's energy comes from burning wood or charcoal. And the lack of trees has decreased the productivity of the agricultural land. So smallholder farmers often have to supplement their incomes by cutting down trees and selling the wood for fuel. And so the way by giving the trees a value to the farmers, that by caring and transplanting and maintaining the trees, they receive these seeds, tools, and training to help their own farm business, it has shifted the dynamic between farmers and trees, and they now see the value of them. And and trees, I, I neglected to say that, you know, trees, that's your logo. Yes. And, and, you know, you, in addition to Haiti, you also do tremendous amount of tree planting in cities. Less so in cities because it's hard to do large scale tree planting in cities. We certainly do plant the occasional tree in a city, but the major large scale tree planting projects for us to date have been in Haiti, the Dominican Republic, and in China, where we're working with a Japanese NGO there called GreenNet, and we are reforesting the Horchin Desert, which is a whole story in and of itself. Well, we love to get some <laughs> pictures of that. We'll put them, put them in the show notes. Okay. I know that you, in your wonderful Engage for Good presentation, you talk about a key tenet, which is capture the content as you go along, because content can be rich with the stories. And you're talking, you started giving um, a future vision of hang tags with content. Communications of sustainability and CSR, it's really hard at times to get down to the individual person. Um, I know that you've got some great ideas at Timberland. Can you share um, how you break through with communications and your um, systems to gather the content as you go along? Well, we're working on developing the system to gather the content as we go along for Haiti Cotton. And in fact, we're working with a team of students at Columbia Business School right now on sort of the best way to go about doing that. But I think what we one of the things we know is that consumers can relate to stories about individuals more so than they can to stories about an issue in general. They want to know how it impacts the individual, how the individual can make a difference. And what is exciting about Haiti Cotton is our ability to have transparency through this data management system that we're creating to the farmers who grew the cotton and be able to share those stories with consumers who, at the end of the day, are going to walk into a Timberland store have see a hang tag on a product that contains Haiti cotton, be able to scan it and see a quick video that begins to tell some of the story of those people. And we hope that by doing that, they will have a richer emotional connection with the people at the beginning of the supply chain, right, who are growing the cotton in the field, the difference that their purchase can make for that person's life and start to become more emotionally engaged in not only the purchases they make from Timberland, but from other companies as well. I think, you know, in the past, we've definitely uh, made the mistake of being overly transparent. I mean, that's never a fault, but what what I mean by that is being overly communicative of all the details of our CSR work. And I think for many many consumers don't want that. Okay. They want to know that that exists, mm -hmm. but they don't need to see all the nitty gritty. Now there are data wonks out there who want to see the nitty gritty. So you need to have it and you need to be able to back up your stuff, but don't lead with that. Right. Yeah. Right. Lead with the impact it's having in community. Lead with an example of one community, one individual that you have made a difference for and extrapolate start there and then go backwards. And people can always dig deeper if they want. But early in the day, we were we were gathering all this information and so excited about it that we were sharing all of it. And it was almost too much for people to get their arms around. I mean, this is really early in the day, right? With the initial CSR reports that we were coming out with in the early 2000s. Yeah, no, I, I like to see uh, these really abbreviated CSR reports that might be on a tiny little pamphlet 
that, you know, just give you the key points. I've seen them at point of sale, seen them a bit on hang tags. And then you're right for the wonks. You have all the, the back, <laughs> the background, background online. I know that Earth Day is coming up um, on April 22nd and that you always do something special. Um, can you talk about your plans and what you do and also what you don't do? Because I think that, again, that can inform our listeners about the power of a day versus multiple days. Yeah. So Earth Day, as I mentioned, is one of the two global service days that we sponsor and recognize for employees worldwide. And so on Earth Day, on or around Earth Day, you will see it pretty much in every Timberland location, they will be, they will have an Earth Day service project in some shape or form. Now here at our corporate headquarters in Stratum, New Hampshire, we have to wait to celebrate Earth Day until May, mid-May, because often in April, the ground is still frozen mm -hmm. and there's not much earthwork that can happen <laughs> right. when the ground is frozen like that. Exactly. So just as an example here, we have about 380 employees in the building. We'll be serving at five different sites around the community. We're going to be working on community gardens, some outdoor learning spaces for different schools, and a bunch of, of projects for schools to help them engage their students more powerfully in the outdoors. So we'll be doing five different projects on that day. How do you measure, especially vis-a-vis -vis individuals and KPIs and in their annual goals versus the kind of measurement that you have regarding um, the millions of trees you planted or actually the components and the way your leather is made. Um, how is your, again, measurement related to people? So the service measurements that we use are, and I referenced them earlier, but the hours utilization rate, which is the percentage of all the about all the hours, service hours that we put on the table every year for employees to use, what percentage of those are actually being used. We have another measure called benefit utilization rate that's looking at the percentage of employees who engage at least once in service and report doing it because these are all these numbers are derived from people reporting their hours. And as far as sort of performance reviews, employees are encouraged to serve all of their 40 hours. And we have an employee recognition program for people worldwide who do mm. um, serve all of their available hours. And it, we call it the 40s club. And then we have a 20s club for part timers that's, that's because nice. they receive yep. up to 20 um, paid hours a year to do service. Mm. So we have an employee recognition program and employees are encouraged to be members of the club. But you have to be careful about dictating, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And and sort of pushing people to serve because then it's no longer volunteerism. How do young people find out about um, companies and their social purpose? And how do they learn about getting a career? And I know you and I share a great love for Net Impact. Net Impact is an amazing resource for people who are wanting to find out more about careers in sustainability, corporate social responsibility, and basically purpose work. It's an organization that has chapters on college campuses and graduate programs, MBA programs, and they have professional chapters as well for people who have this sense of purpose and wanting to see purpose come to life through business and change the world with it. It's a great meeting ground for that, for people with it, that shared interest. And they have an incredible conference that I can't speak highly enough of every year where they bring speakers and all the chapters come together. And it's a great place to build your network. And we will put Check a link. It out. Li yeah, we'll put a link to Net Impact on our website. Um, you on the personal side, you have this wonderful farm, Willowbrook Farm and Art Center. And I know that's another part of your personal passion. Can you talk a little bit about that? So Willowbrook Farm and Art Center, we're focused on the farm part now. It's a fledgling nonprofit that my husband and I launched a few years ago. And it is an incubator and launch pad for beginning organic farmers. So we offer fellowships for young farmers to live on the farm property and farm the land and we mentor and guide them and share equipment with them to help them incubate a farm business so that when they leave the fellowship, 
they have a viable business and experience farming the land so that they can go on and acquire their own farmland and, and continue to farm. We're, we're concerned about the industrialization of farming, the lack of community resilience when we don't produce our own food. And we're wanting to give young farmers a leg up in the world. Yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful program. So we'll put a link to that in our show notes, too. Gosh, this is an amazing conversation. And we're kind of coming around the corner of trying to get to the end. But I'd love to ask you your top three, four or five, whatever you'd like to give us um, insights for your peers on their journey to activate the social purpose in their company, no matter if it's in the foundation and it's beginning to move towards the business or whether it's much closer to the business? Well, I think, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important to think globally and act locally. One size does not fit all. So when you're creating a purpose and purpose activations, I'd say give the regions or the different stakeholders some leeway and freedom to activate in the way that they see is most appropriate because you'll get the most support and engagement that way. I think it's also important to be prepared to take risks. Mm. You may not get it right, right away. And I think obviously be well researched and humble about the mistakes that you may make, but don't be afraid to take risks because if we stay safe all the time, mm. no one's really ever going to move the needle. I think ask for feedback as you go, check in with stakeholders, see how it's going, you know, have a mindset of continuous improvement and be strategic about celebrating a culture of purpose. Figure ah. out how you're going to celebrate your champions. How are you going to keep a steady drumbeat of communications going? How are you going to put actions behind your words so it's not just words? People have visual and physical evidence of your purpose coming to life, both within the walls of your company, but also out in the community. Otherwise, I think purpose just becomes words on a page. It has to be fed and fueled with actions, actions that people can see and notice and engage in and be a part of it so they feel ownership of it. And I, let me jump in here because um, we're beginning, unfortunately, to hear this term uh, purpose washing. <laughs> and because well, you knew that was coming, right? Well, I mean, it's yeah, I it's the buzzword now. Yeah, it it is. And you know, when the ANA proclaims a brand purpose as the word of the year in 2018, and now they've created a center for <laughs> brand purpose, and CCP has changed their name now to Chief Executives for Corporate Purpose. Um, uh -huh. There's a lot of great people, and you have the Larry Fink letter and declaration. But um, what do you think of this kind of purpose washing and how do people you, you gave some ideas about how to stay at it. But what's your point of view on it? Well, I think it's of course, there's going to be some purpose washing because it's sort of as I referenced earlier, purpose is now becoming a, its entry point. You know, everyone's got a purpose. And I think the di what differentiates is how authentic it is, how robust it is. And that's where you need the data behind the quick videos that tell the happy story about your purpose to really prove your point. Do you have um, a favored way to collect the data? Because there's many different levels of data. We do it from a service perspective through our global stewards. So we create, we collect the data. Uh, data from them and enter it into a big database, but we also make sure that we collect anecdotes mm. from them okay. because that's what's going to enable us to tell the story about the individual experience, right? And mm -hmm. extrapolate from there. Right. So we make sure that we correct, collect both the qualitative, quantitative, but also qualitative and, and more than just qualitative was the event good or not good, but, but the anecdote, you know, a spark that happened. So we try to gather that information as well to fuel a bank of stories that we can tell internally and externally. Sure. And then you put, you've planted millions and millions of trees. And so how do you keep track of all of those? Because some of them were online. And if you hit a certain number, then they became real in the world. So how do you keep track of them? 
Well, that was a long time ago, that initiative that you referenced with the virtual trees, but we keep track of them through the partners, the responsible partners that we work with who do the bulk of our tree planting work. Um, The large-scale tree planting projects we have in Haiti, the Horchin Desert in China, and in the Dominican Republic. We are also, the stewards may be planting trees at service events, and then they are responsible for reporting those. But the millions of trees and the high volume tree planting is happening through partners who who share that information and keep track of it for us. Who do you admire the most besides Timberland and not a company owned by VF? So somebody outside of VF. Well, you know, it's top of mind for me because I was just in a meeting and we were talking about them, but Ben and Jerry's. Not only do I love ice cream, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> but, and people say my daughter is made of Ben and Jerry's because I consumed an inordinate amount of ice cream when I was pregnant. But I will say that they are not afraid to take risks mm. on yeah. social issues that they feel need attention. Mm. And I admire that, that boldness, that, that courage. Um, and that willingness to take a stand and their humility when they make a mistake or it doesn't work well, you know, and, but it's it sort of in part, it's been baked into their culture from the very beginning. And so they just go for it. And, and, and I yeah. admire that spirit. We don't all have the same freedom to do that. Right. But I wish we did. And, and it's great that Unilever, who bought Ben and Jerry's, yes. um, the same day that they also bought Slim Fast, which to me was a riot. I, they got rid of Slim Fast. <laughs> I didn't realize they, that. They, that was funny. Yeah, Thank they goodness, got rid of Slim yes. Fast, but they kept Ben and Jerry's. That they allowed them okay. to do what they do. Well, it's the same sort of approach, I think. I think, you know, VF and, and Unilever, I believe that they both, recognize that when you're acquiring brands that have a personality and have a following because of it, that you don't want to mess with what works. Yeah. Well, and that's smart when they do that. Um, so is there, um, what's next for Atlanta? I mean, you have done so many amazing things. You've been in the private company, Timberland, you've been in the body shop, by the way, did you work, was Anita Roddick still alive when you worked there? Absolutely. Uh, what would, okay, I got to ask you. She's why I went there. What, what's it like? I mean, obviously she's passed on, broke my heart. But what was it like working with Anita Roddick? Amazing. <laughs> I mean, she was a visionary, not only in terms of how to integrate purpose into business and how to make that your brand. I mean, it, it grew for her out of necessity, mm-hmm. right? She started res- refilling bottles because she couldn't afford to buy more bottles right. for her business. It right. grew out of her garage. So it started from there. But then she realized that, wait a minute, you can really build a brand around this. So it, it was amazing. And she was always coming up with new ideas. I mean, you'd be talking about one thing and she'd have an idea about something completely different that you would sort of write down and keep track of. But she was constantly thinking about how to have a bigger impact, how to make a difference, how to be bold, Mm -hmm. how to make sure your consumers were gobsmacked, Mm -hmm. which was the expression, just shocked with your boldness and creativity. And it was really fun. (laughs) Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, So today it's harder to be gobsmacked. Because, you know, you got the ad agencies out there and they're doing good things, purpose washing things. You've got so many young people or older people say to me, I want to work in social purpose. So how do you get gobsmacked um, if uh, you're trying to really break through today? I think you follow your passion. You don't compromise. You as a as a a young person looking for work or seeking that opportunity to make your difference, be clear about your passions and your commitments. And I think more companies are starting to look for that as they start to build their purpose agenda. And I think that that will take you far. I mean, just don't, don't pretend to be something you're not, which is pretty basic advice, but I think it rings, rings more true now than ever before. Well, that that's a great way to close. Um, we're going to have lots of great show notes and we're going to have, we'll put a connection to the body shop. 
Um, certainly, um, you're great engaged for good and some of the resources that you're going to send to us that we can share to young people. So I want to thank Atlanta. You know, you said be clear about your passions and your commitments. And uh, Atlanta McElraith, you are one of, you're not just an earth keeper. You are in the Hall of Fame in my book um, in terms of social purpose and just doing it so right. So congratulations to you. I trust you're going to have a really long runway with Timberland. But whatever you do in the future, we as people and colleagues and consumers and communities are made so much better because you are in the world. So thank you so very much for being on Purpose 360. I'm Carol Cohn. This is a great conversation. Share it with your friends. Give us your feedback, how we can get better. Also give us names of people you'd like us to interview. So again, thank you, Atlanta, and have a great day. Thank you, Carol, for this wonderful opportunity and for the amazing work that you do. 